Um, she's our speaker tonight. And if you haven't ever figured out, she is a lawyer, but she is a whole lot more than just a lawyer. And, and um, well, for one thing, she's the executive director of, of Tiger Trust. I think the actual title in India is, is what? Remind me. <laughs> Honorary secretary. Honorary <laughs> secretary. And you know, in the United States, that doesn't sound like maybe the kind of title that you'd want, but in India, that means she's the one in charge. So that's why I said director instead. And what she does, among many things, is she, she designs and carries out training programs that has touched probably most, if not all, of the park officials that are involved with tiger parks all over India. So her hand has reached across that country. And um, she loves tigers. I mean, we, from, <laughs> from the time we first met her when we went to India, we, we discovered that very, and she loves them very passionately too. And that will come through. And so without further ado, I wanna introduce and invite uh, Anjana Gosain to share with us, share her message, but also motivate us to action. Thank you, Louis. Before I begin my talk, I thank you very much for Tigers for Tigers, but I'd like to give a memento from Tiger Trust to Tigers for Tigers. This is a calendar which I would like to unveil for everybody. Can you do that? This is a present from India to United States, and this is the calendar which is the beginning of the year for our joint efforts. So you have this calendar of 2013. This is from Tiger Trust to Tigers for Tigers. So I'm glad that I didn't come between you and the dinner. It was organized that, in a way that we are relaxed. I hope before the yawning begins, I begin my evening with you. Life is short and so are good moments. So we begin with a colorful cover. It's a story of despair and hope. Please don't take despair as an indication of something sad, because in life, you come across ups and downs. On to the left is the tiger. That's our national animal and world's pride. You have the peacock. That's our national bird. And then we have the elephant, which is the next most important animal. I say next because in my eyes, tiger remains number one. So we are here in a colorful combination of all exotic animals and being little partial to tiger, I think protection is required by all of them. So you have seen the movie today and the idea to show the movie was to at least acquaint you. You know, when you fall in love, before that you have some imagination in life that when those moments are going to come. So I'm preparing you for that, but this love is going to be different. So here we go. It's very, very important to know who is a tiger you have heard about it. But do you know certain private, or you can say very important, and very regular and ordinary facts about the tiger? Why is the name tiger? Tiger's name is taken from the Greek word tigris. It's speed. And what is the speed of a tiger? is certainly you have seen in the movie, you have seen in the, in the pictures, but no. These facts are, the first name is from the Greek word and it is derivative of the Persian word for arrow. And you know what is the importance of arrow. As you say, when you, when you talk badly, they say sorry. Once the word bad up, words are out like an arrow, they can never come back. Similarly, the speed is the basic factor for keeping the word tigris. And from there, we may call him tiger. Now, most tigers have over 100 stripes. 
yeah, like you know your fingers, you have your hands, you have the lines, you go to astrologer, he tells you how long you're going to live, etc., etc. But these stripes are the lifelines. That is the identity of a tiger. Your parents keep your name. I'm known by Anjana Gosai, so I have an ident identity. But these tigers, their stripes are, is the identity. And with thousands and thousands of tigers, even if you take 20 pictures, not one tiger would match with another. That is God's will. That is God's creation. That this animal must stand of its own and can never, he's matchless. So you may have a stripe to see. Indian Royal Bengal Tiger is, is, is towards mango yellow. Sumatran is darker. Siberian is lighter. So every country, every country where you have, for your information, there are six places where you have tigers. India is the largest. You have Nepal. You have Malaysia. You have Bhutan. You have them in Bangladesh and you have them in Indonesia, and then you have some of them left in Russia. But in total, in total, in the wild, India has the largest number. Now, you saw that in the movie, the tigers were running for the hunt, but only one is successful out of 10. So he has to really work hard to find the food. It's not that, that he can go to McDonald's and buy a food for himself. He has to fend for himself. And that is what makes him really rearing to go. Now, a fully grown tiger can eat up to 30 kgs. Now, I want to tell you one thing very interesting. There is this T37, a tigress, who just died about a week ago, just three years old, very healthy looking tigress. And we got very worried. I got after the authorities to find out, and we got the postmortem done. You'll be surprised. She was diagnosed with diabetes, she was diagnosed with high cholesterol, and she had cancer. Why? Because she was consuming wild boars. So 30 kgs of meat, it all depends what she's consuming, or the tiger is consuming. So basically, try to appreciate there is no difference in illnesses, in existence of a tiger, than the human beings. So what she was consuming over the period, uh, diseased her body, and then because of obesity, she died. And this is the report of the postmortem. It was not poaching. So 30 kgs of meat depends what the tiger is consuming. Now, the stripes on each tiger are unique, as you've said, but they are distinguishable. Now, what is the roar? How do you identify a tiger? He is the tiger. No other animal on this earth his roar or his voice or his the calling out can go as high as long as two kilometers at night. If he's roaring, you can hear his voice till two kilometers, which is very unusual, and particularly in dead of the night. So whenever there is a movement at night, the animals get to know he's moving. Tiger is not slimy. Leopard is. Panther is. Tiger is a royal animal, and he thinks I'm very powerful. He walks straight. He's a straight guy. He doesn't know how to go left and right. He walks straight. So when you heard in the movie that they take one path, mentally also they take one path, and they fall. And they become the biggest prey for poaching. Now, how much do they talk, walk or they swim? There is a myth. Can a tiger swim? 30 kilometers in a day. That is something which is very, very common. But where do they swim? Do they have enough rivers to swim? This is only in rainforests. Majority parks in India have the topography of green forest, dry forest, sal forest. You have heard the teak. Teak is generally connected with good furniture, you know, Italian, whatever. But the sal forest is found in India. And that's where you have water bodies. But yes, in Assam, you have in certain other parts, like you have it in Calcutta, Sundarbans, which is all rainforest, water around. There, it's known they swim up to 30 kilometers in a day. Now, how do you mark your territory? 
human beings can go and conquer a place and say, I'm the king. You win elections, you become president. But how does a tiger mark his territory? He urinates all around the area. And with the scent of the urine, the other tiger or tigress gets to know there's another, this is the tiger and this is his territory. So usually when the other tiger enters into that territory, there is a fight. Scent of a urine is so strong that automatically the other animals and even the other tigers get to know this is the territory. And for a healthy territory, healthy habitat, a tiger needs, I don't know what you say in the United States, is 30 square kilometers. Takako told me it has to be 30 acres in, in comparison. But we call it 30 square kilometers. It's a healthy place, but it's a dream. There is no longer this kind of space available because we are the ones to encourage. Tigers do respond to the roars because if one tiger is sitting there, his roar is gone to the another, he becomes alert, he either leaves or he tries to attack. So there is a language communication between them. Now the movement of the cubs arouses the tiger's maternal instinct, but she's very independent. If she finds him stillborn, she just tries to revive, but finally leaves them. And like any other young boys and girls, as you leave home at 18, the cubs leave the mother's house at the age of two or three. They have to be independent. These are the few facts which I thought is very necessary for you to know, to get to know interesting that how these tigers, they have to live and how they behave. Because it is not essentially good to know that what is the habitat, but it is also when you go and see them, which I'm assuming, I'm not assuming, I'm, I'm hoping that you get to see them next year. So it will be very easy for you to observe them. Now, just around 1,700 are left in India. Now, there is a difference in the wild and in the captivity. We are in captivity or we are in the wild. When we are living in our homes, we are living by ourselves. We are living with freedom and we are living with all rights. But this is the same status of tigers. When they live in the wild, they are having full constitutional rights. They have everything to themselves. But in captivity, you know what is the difference. So what are we talking about? We are talking about the naturally born tigers in a natural habitat. Today, we are left with 17 in India. Why? And how is this population? How accurately can we talk about 1,700 I'll take, take you to the procedure because, as you saw in the movie, they talked about the counting. Counting is not very easy. There is now a recognized method which you must know because you cannot say it is 1700. You cannot say 1852. You cannot say 1030 because these are the things which started in the year 72. India was the first country who prohibited hunting. So the law became in 1972 by an enactment called Wildlife Protection Act 1972. Then the first census was carried out. Turn of the century we had 40,000 tigers in India in 1900. And now we are left in 2013 or last census was done in 2010. Now you can see 1827, 3015, 3750, 1411. By the time 1706, I think we have lost another 30. So I will not vouch, I will not say, because I do not believe in number games. To, to my mind, it's silly. But still, I would say that this is the present number given by us by the Ministry of Forest and Environment, Government of India. So these are the figures. And how do we arrive at this? Kindly see. This census methodology, as you have seen in the movie, is the recognized system of the scientist, is that is the camera method. Now, how does the camera method work? It's a very, very long procedure. Mr. Ulhas Karanth had to fight for 15 years. And I'm very proud to say that I was the first one to petition the Supreme Court in 1992 to challenge the census methodology on behalf of Tiger Trust. And I said, all these numbers which are coming from the government are fudged. 
there has to be a scientific method to count. There has to be, a, there has to be accountability. There has to be transparency. I fought single-handedly for seven long years. We funded it from our pockets. I, I will take, when will the time come, you will get introduced to Tiger Trust and the other people involved. But I was happy that after seven years struggle, the government of India was directed by the Honorable Supreme Court of India to recognize this method of camera and change the methodology from pug marks to the camera method. But how do you do that? It is the field data collected at the beat level. What is a beat level? The beat level is like you have five, seven tables here. Every forest has at one particular division a beat. The beat center, which is uh, manned by the forest officials and the forest guards. With the beat and with ocular vision and by daily data they collect, they take a sample of number of tigers around the area. That is a very primitive method, but a very accurate method. Because they are on patrolling, and they get to see, and they identify the tigers. So with that, standardized protocol means that is the system which is going on over the years. So with that standardized protocol, they collect the data, and that is how it is put in a paper. Then what is the analysis of habitat status of tiger using satellite data? Now what it is like, if it is Ranthambor, I'm talking in Rajasthan, it is a dry area because Rajasthan is a desert area. Then we take Sundarbans, it is rainforest, it's got water all around. Third is Kanha and Bandhavgarh. The topography there is known as a range of greenery, that means sal forest, teak. Lot of trees and then you have, bow, the, you have valleys, they're, they're the most beautiful parks, that is these two parks. So basically, they will decide after analyzing how this habitat has to be looked into for census. Then you see the final phase is three, camera trapping. You saw that, what is the camera trapping? This is a tree, this is a camera, this is where they'll tie the camera, and those cameras remain on all the time. And during the census methodology, or whenever the months are chosen, whenever the Tiger crosses in front of the camera, it clicks. Once it clicks, the picture is stored in, and then he walks another two, three kilometers, there's another camera, then his picture is taken. Over the area, on the basis of analysis, which you saw in phase one, after the data is collected by these scientists, you will see those pictures are collected, and the stripes are matched, and that is how the pictures are taken together, and then you have the accurate number. So this census methodology is one which was used in the last census, and on that basis, the arrival is of 1802 and odd. Now, we said 1700, the number is 1800, it really doesn't matter. What are the challenges which is faced by this animal? Basically, it's us. He has no other challenge but the human being. Because every activity you will see he is facing is due to number of reasons. You have seen it, but I just want to make it as short and interesting for you. What is habitat loss? Nowadays, all developers are looking at raising structures. But what is the habitat loss due to human settlement? See, for 500 years, 400 years, these tribals, you also have tribals in the US, they were part of the forest. It is us who decided in 1972 to declare a particular habitat to call it a project tiger. So at that particular time, all these villagers were inside the park. The moment we declared them that it is a park for the habitat of the tiger, say this is the room, and we decide the tigers have to stay here, but unless I clear the table, unless I ask you to go, can another person come and sit here? No way. That didn't happen. We did not clear the villages out of these park areas, and we decided to declare them. So there was a complete animosity among the tribals and the forest officials. They never got together. They said, sorry, we had 400 years ago rights to live here, and you are asking us to go out. So they never synchronized. So what happened? Those settlements continued to remain. Because it was a big financial drain for the Indian government to give them compensation. 
They gave compensations in few of them and rest of them remained. So these habitats, it's correct, incorrect to say, have come now. They have been there since the beginning. So the parks where the settlements continue, which has not been given an alternative by the government, they continue to throng and that is a threat to the habitat. That is actually and technically called the loss of habitat. By whom? By human settlements. And by whom? The humans have not settled the rights of the animals because they are quiet. They are, they are the victims and we are the ones who are victimizing them. Unless we settle that issue, the habitat protection or the habitat loss cannot be compensated. Another major issue we are finding is this, that the carnivores are, if not getting enough prey base, they generally go out of their area and then they start looking for their food. In that, they end up eating the cattle. The cattle belong to whom? To those people who have been living inside the park and now have been forced by the policy makers to go outside the park. So when they are staying outside the park in the periphery, their cattle grazing is there and they become victims and they become the prey base of these tigers. So what is happening? Now I will not, I can say with full sense of responsibility, no longer is China a threat to us. Please mark the words. We are now a victim of our own circumstances. The tigers are being killed in India due to man-animal conflict and by the villages and by the people around because they are losing cattle, their compensation of insurance is low, they do not get enough money. So the trading which was there, a threat of China, has ceased. It is more or less the local poaching. So we are having a threat within the threat. So because of that, they are being killed by using snars, by poisoning, by electrocution, and so many other methods. So it is now a it's challenge to our own selves because of this particular peculiar position. And then you have the fearing human settlers, as you saw, the tigresses and the tigers, they have to leave their area and go elsewhere. Right now, a Ranthambore tiger was found sitting on the railway track. There are three more tigers which are missing from the park because they have left their territory being threatened by the grazers. So these are the few very, very important issues which we need to address. Now, why tigers are easy to poach? As I tell you, temperament. He goes the same, he's a straight guy. He has known all his life, this is my area and that's where I'm going to walk. So it's very predictable for the poachers to know where he's walking. And then they are territorial. They do not stay at one place. If you, if you think the tigers have notification in their mind that this is my habitat of Ranthambore, I cannot go beyond this area because this is notified by the government. No, they move. Wherever they see threat, they go. And because of that, you can see all their lives using that particular path, they know, the poachers know, and they make a plan overnight. They exactly know with certain research that when and how he is going to be caught. And that is how they plant certain other methods to poach them. Now kindly see, every part which you saw in the movie, what is used? Whiskers for toothache, bile for convulsions in chinya, tail for various skin diseases, fat for vomiting, dog bites, bleeding, hemorrhoids, and scalp ailments, skin to treat mental illness. I think we all need to correct our mental right. And, and I don't know with this animal's skin, but otherwise, I think we should take medicine to correct our vision for him. Blood for strengthening the constitution and willpower. Brain to cure laziness. I mean, just like there's no other method to correct your laziness, <laughs> but, to, but to use his authorities. Teeth for rabies, asthma, and sores. So various other aspects. So can you see this use of this animal is this, whether he's alive, he's giving. When he's dead, he's still giving. He's a giver. He's not asking you for anything. He's only asking for things that at least leave him alone. Now, what are the measures which have failed? Everywhere you have administration taking care of this particular system. We have a forest department, we have the forest minister, we have the forest secretary, everything is in place. But what are they doing? They have continued to use the bug mark method so I'm still not very sure whether it was 1100, whether it was 1400, whether it is still 1800, because 
the method of pug mark has been on since 72. Then taxpayers' money wasted in what futile development projects, which you saw in the movie, it's fairly correct. But the, the latest example I'm giving you is this. Whatever money is sanctioned by government of India to these park authorities, 50% goes back unspent. Why? Because they do not know what kind of projects they are supposed to do for them. One of them said, we asked them, that what can you do? They said, why don't we open some automobile repair centers in the park? I said, what for? All the gypsies which are roaming around in the area, they can fall flat. So we have to create, a gen uh, you know, we have to generate employment. So why don't we do one thing? We can give this kind of alternative uh, jobs to the villagers. So are, do, you, do you think these are the kind of projects we can talk about in the parks? No. But the money has to be spent, it's spent on useless projects where digging continues to go, as you saw, the rain harvesting, which is not required. Forest guards are not equipped with adequate weapons. This is a big story. In India, now this is the bill which you saw, which got defeated yesterday. In India, you cannot own or you cannot possess any arm. So basically, the forest guards will never be allowed to have the guns or the arms because that's not the policy of the government. The government wants the protection to be done with sticks, which is impossible. There's only one state in India, Assam, where the forest guards have been given the guns. Now those guns, how adequate they are, are is, is very difficult to believe because most of the poaching is done by these poachers with very, very sophisticated arms. Now kindly see how he's killed. The first is an instance of electrocution. This is the case which I fought. And these are the pictures which are taken from the court. That is the cable which was set. And this is the paw of the tiger, which while entering into that fence area, he got electrocuted. And that is the part of the body which was recovered from the uh, villager's house. This is the carcass, finally, which had which was found a few days later. This is the poacher's face. We interviewed him. He's behind bars because this is the skin of a tigress called Sita. She was one of the very popular tigress tigresses. She gave birth to 14 cubs in Madhya Pradesh. And this skin was discovered later on. But I'm very, very happy to say that we fought his, this case and we got the guys convicted. They are behind bar. Now, these are the other parts which you found in the border areas being traded. Traded by these parts of the tigers, various body parts, bones. Mostly this is found in Nepal and China. This is what you need to do and here is this, that illegal trading which has been taking place and they are being sold in the open markets. The dying roar, this is one of the very, very, there are four to five types of methods used to kill the tiger. One is poisoning. Poisoning is done by either poisoning the water sources or they poison the animal and the cubs, they innocently they go, eat away, and then suddenly you see them dead. Third is the snar, which I told you is a very crude device, which is, which is dug inside and the animal walks innocently. And then the paw is stuck and then they beat him with the sticks. And fourth is the bullet, which is very rarely used because it makes noise and you get caught. So the poachers do not use for the tiger. Now, these are the challenges which the tiger faced. But what can you do for him? There is a difference between, I was just saying, conservation and conversation. We continue to converse about it, or do we conserve about it? Because we need to conserve and we, used, we need to converse less. That means more action, less talking. So how do we do about it? We see this Tiger Task Force much talked about the Honorable Prime Minister was when we were shocked to hear that Sariska, a park, a pride, is totally wiped off. There were more than 16 tigers, and they got completely wiped off in a short span of two years. Once the park got wiped off, then it was decided, let's do something. And then at the national level, this task force made, and this tiger task force went into inquiry, suspended a couple of heads, the heads rolled, 
and then they finally didn't know what to do. So the park remained empty without anything for a number of years till something else happened, which is going to come up shortly. There is a unique thing which they decided is translocation. Translocation means if Clemson gets very crowded, pick up few students and dump them in another university and pick up some more where it's less and balance the population. This is something is called translocation. Project Tiger, which is, of course, a very, very proud thing to me to announce that this trust which I am looking after was founded by the first project director, Mr. Kailash Sankhla, and he was the one who started this. That was the first recognized autonomous body to give the rights, the recognition to the tiger. And then Constitution of India, it is, uh, they have made a control cell to be headed. And this is the fourth one, which I said is the translocation, one of the recommendations given by this. Now, accept the shortcoming, very tough. If you have committed some mistake, would you admit to yourself? I don't think so. It's very, very hard for a human being to accept shortcomings. Very easy to say. But then, in management, you have to do that. Because whenever you come to park management, you have to at least see what has gone wrong in the past. These are the few things which they, which they need to accept is this. One, bullet for bullet, you have heard about it. Death for death, offenses to be met with strictest punishment. And I must tell you that Indian Wildlife Protection Act is the only act which is copied or, or you can say followed in rest of the countries. The, the act was enacted in 1972. It is being followed in letter and spirit, in letter and spirit, provision-wise, bit by bit, in all other countries where the tigers are found. And because of the best law, India is the most legislated country, but very poor in implementation. So we need to do is not only enact the legislation, but implement it. You have to have good leadership. It's a very unfortunate thing that with billions of population, you still need a leader, which is still not good. What happens on the top comes till the down. That is the science. So if you have a good administrator, good policy maker, things will roll down, and you will have good and better effect. So it is better to see what are the shortcomings. Are we ready to accept them? Are we ready to see them? That is what is close cooperation among whom? Can there be a cooperation? I think we have five tables, six tables here. When we'll do brainstorming tomorrow, I don't know how many ideas are going to be accepted by everybody. But the message is this, yes, work together. See all the departments which have to come to an understanding, work under cooperation. Radical changes, now this is the second past which we are doing is legal training to forest guards and providing them, not OK. <laughs> yes, legal training to forest guards and providing them with adequate weapons. These are two distinct things. Legal knowledge is also a weapon, and physical weapon is also a weapon. Which is more powerful? We have to bring both of them together. A skill by mind and physical enforcement. If there's two of them are given to them, I'm sure we'll go far away. But right now, we are fighting on the first left, first side, the legal training. As far as the adequate weapons are concerned, it's a matter of concern. It remains on paper. We cannot think of implementation because of our laws and because of the constitutional difficulties we have. So it's very easy for me to print here, but I know it will not go beyond this. Now, create inviolate spaces. This is very difficult. Very, very difficult. There is, this is what the tigers want. This is what they are looking for, privacy. They are looking for their own homes. They are looking for an area where they don't want to see you. But how many inviolate areas? I don't know um, if any one of you know that Supreme Court shut down all the national parks in India. Are you aware? No. For three months, there was no tourism. No tourism from June to October. This is the only Supreme Court in the world who can do this. But why were they forced? Should I tell you? Do you want to hear it? They were pained to do that because 
they found the declaration of inviolate spaces has not been complied with. There was a direction by the Supreme Court months ago, create some inviolate areas, let the tigers have their own home, let them live peacefully. Once they found there are no inviolate spaces, there are no management plans coming, they immediately ordered all the parks to shut down. There was a huge cry in the court. There are stakeholders, hoteliers, guards, transporters, they all made, I think we became very rich by the way. All the lawyers became rich, they almost earned as much as to open a park of themselves. But finally, after three months, when they gave an undertaking that we would comply with this, then only the parks were opened in the month of October 2012. So that is one shock which the park authorities have heard and learnt, that there can be somebody. So I'm sure the tigers were very happy that somebody acted on their behalf, acted for the silent victims. Now, restrict human population, which is something now being carried out by various authorities to shift these villages from inside to outside, give them compensations, alternative lands, to l have lesser pressure then regulate excessive tiger tourism. I'm sure uh, neither David nor uh, Lou is going to be happy about it because they are being victim this year, because not, I'm, I'm just joking, because of the excessive tiger tourism, there is a debate. I'm sure if I put this house to the debate, 50% would say it's my right to go and see the tiger, and 50% would think whether we should or we should not. So this subject, I'd like to leave it open but if you want to ask my opinion, I would say regulated, there is nothing called regulation. Regulation in life is very difficult, particularly when it involves passion, when it involves love, when it involves interest, when it involves people who want to see such a beautiful animal. So it has to be your self-regulation. Self-regulation means when you go to the park, how you need to behave, how much you need to show interest, you can see 50% of the people who visit the park are either making noises or they are talking or they are just interested in tiger. You saw the tiger? You saw the tiger? You saw the tiger? I must share in Bandhagwar Jungle Lodge where you go and stay. We had several tourists who were drinking extra. He said, what's wrong? We didn't see the tiger. We didn't see the tiger. We are, we are just <laughs> trying to, you know, get rid of this. We have had seven days here. Out of seven days, we have made 14 trips, but we are really stuck. We are, we are just trying to get over our depression. But can I say one thing? In this regulation, there has to be a mental regulation that is love for nature, love for environment. Do you go and see with the focus of tiger, or do you appreciate his habitat itself? That is something which is to be taught. So before you all go, before you commit yourself, and you fall in love with this animal, just feel, try to feel that what is he surrounded with? What are the things around him? The birds, the trees, the tranquility, the beauty, the water, and of course, a feeling that maybe with all this, I will get to see him, and that will be a beautiful moment. And that is called, according to me, regulation, and that is what we need to exercise of our own not by legislation or by the authorities. Now this is the wonderful translocation attempt made in Sariska. This is the first step. They took those tigers from Ranthambore. This is the first step, they tranquilized them. The tiger is tranquilized for about not more than 30 minutes because tranquility, uh, tranquilization can also be fatal. So they are generally lifted by the helicopters, then the radio collar is put around the neck so that they are not left unattended. After the tranquilization, see, he is left, after he wakes up, he is left in the wild, and that's how he said by the first translocated tiger in Sariska. And now we are a happy owner, we can say, Indians, we are the happy, happy owners of now nine tigers in Sariska and six in Panna because translocation has been very, very successful. So this one of the methods has really yielded results because it was based with good research, good attempt and good efforts. We have waited for four years to have two cubs in Sariska. 
So they were born just three months ago. And I was fortunate to see them. Now this is what is my passion. This was all technical conversation. Now I'm sharing why I'm here 12,000 miles away from Delhi and who brought me here. We have all shared, Takako will share her passion why she got introduced. Maybe David would tell you, maybe Louis would tell you. But my passion, my love, and my mentor is Mr. Kelar Sankla. He was, now you can see he is receiving the, he is receiving the award from the Prime Minister, Mrs. Gandhi, whom you heard the movie, was the first Prime Minister to start this project, and he was the first director. And that is his son, my friend, who introduced me to this beautiful world of tigers. We were together in college. I was appointed the Honorary Secretary in 1989. Mr. Sankla passed away in 94, and then both of us took over the Tiger Trust and lost Pradeep in 2003. And that's how the responsibility is on my shoulders. And I have very good friends who are present here, my other friends in Delhi, who are helping me out to run this trust and be here. And I've traveled all the way to share this passion with you because I got this opportunity to talk to you, to share my thoughts. And this is the responsibility which I took. And that is how I became passionate about this majestic animal. But what are we doing? What am I doing? Am I only lecturing? Am I only here to maybe tell you in a, in a big hall? No, I don't work. This is perhaps the third or the maybe the fourth lecture I have, or maybe a sharing with you. Mostly I work in the field. And I'm thankful to USFWS who granted us two projects. That is called the Capacity Building Program on Wildlife Offenses. The biggest threat tiger is facing, or the animals are facing, are the poaching. So what we do, what do we do is this, first of all, we have <coughs> completed two projects and we have trained 550 guards in Assam in Rajasthan. And what are we telling them? What are we teaching them is this. Kindly see, this is the training. Now, what we train them about is the, in the classroom, it's a very difficult job by the way. Because training those guards who think they are a part of the forest, first thing we tell them in the class is, what are the provisions? What are the acts? How the prohibition of hunting is there? So they have to first understand what are their rights, what are their duties, and how legally they have to implement. Then after the grueling classrooms, we take them to the field. You see this here? We give them mock cases. We get, create mock situations. We tell them there is a hunting, there is how the animal has been killed and what you have to do with them. And this goes on for days together. We live in the field, we live in the forest, and we live in very primitive situations with these trainees. This is a Sam. This is the person who is trying to show us how they arrest, how they try to nab a poacher. And that is how the exercise is done. So we are doing these trainings in 110 degrees. Sometimes we are doing in rain. Sometimes we are doing in acute winter. But thanks to the faculty which I get, we do it. And today we can say, due to this training, the number of people across in the last 10 years, Tiger Trust has trained more than 2,000 forest personnel. And the last ones we have done is this, these two. And now when we go back, we are going to start in Taroba, Maharashtra. This is also taught, the veterinarians tell them how to make a scene of crime of scene, how to lift the evidence, how to collect the blood, and that's how every forest guard today who is trained under a training program is equipped, has the knowledge to do this. I cannot promise what they do finally, but at least the attempt has been made and we have worked like a catalyst. How has this program been beneficial? The beneficial is this, they have got better legal skills. At least they know what they have to do, and when the time comes, how they have to act. They are confident, they are better educated, and now, at least they have learned how to talk to their seniors and how much they need to do in a case. We have got better conviction rates. The feedbacks have shown 
the arrests are in, have increased. And number of cases, though registered, are achieving better success than what they have. And the best part is this, now they feel involved. They don't feel hapless. They don't feel helpless. They think we are equipped and we are confident. Now, we, other thing which we do is catch them young. You see these young people, these young students. I just want to share the thought of this girl. When I explained to her, why do you want to save the tiger and what would you do? She just got up and said, the first thing I'm going to do is, she threatened me. She said, I'll get a gun and kill the poacher. The other girl said, she's five years. She said, I want to write a letter to the Chinese prime minister and tell him, stop killing our tigers. Now, this is a thought process of five, a thought process of six years old. If I'm catching that young age, I'm motivating you people. I don't know how far I would be successful, but I'm sharing these facts with you that if we catch them, if the awareness program is made at a larger scale, we'll have more and more aware, younger generation, our time is over. I think we are, we are in the process to say bye, but then you are there to take over. And that's what I'm saying, catch them young. And this is one of the very successful plans we have. And for this, I thank partly and quite completely Tigers for Tigers, with whom we have this collaboration since 10 years, and what all we have been doing. Tiger Trust and Tigers for Tigers have shared fantastic healthcare programs, schools, and then joining together with the village schools in the periphery of the national parks, where I'm sure some of you, if you're present here, have had wonderful experience in talking and sharing their thoughts, how they feel about their part of the site. And the students from Tigers for Tigers have been carrying very nice gifts and also have been sharing their thoughts. And of course, they have jointly learned to love and understand that why and how this tiger is to be saved. And that is one of the major contributions made for Tigers for Tigers with Tiger Trust is this, that it's become global. Today, we were not one school. We are seven of us. Maybe it could be 10. Maybe it could be 12. I see a very large future and a very bright future. If you join with Tigers for Tigers, Tiger Trust is a humble organization. It's more, it runs not on petrol, not on money. It runs on passion. If you have passion, join me. There will be no problem. Some of the pictures which we shared, you can see the expression. Every year, Tigers for Tigers, whether it's this much or this much, but I think whatever I get from them, is accepted with a lot of love and affection, and I always cherish it. Whatever they bring, whatever donations, whatever the students give us, it's very, very important for us. Now, the big cat, which inspired writers and hunters, is battling for survival. I'm sure you're joining my crusade for this survival, and this is the message they are giving you. Live, and let me live. But this is a story, this is the story of the Bengal tiger, but I have another story which you saw the calendar, and it's a very nice story of the most world famous tigress called Machli. Machli is a tiger, tigress, which you will go on the net and you will find has the maximum number of hits. But do you want to spend a day in Machli's life? Are you interested to know that? I'll share that with you. You start the next one here. Machli is from Ranthambur. And she is the one which is on that calendar. Machli is the most photographed tigress. But I just want to share some of the very hilarious shots and a very nice little story of five minutes which I want to tell you about her. So there has to be another one. There's a video for that. Yes, I think it's there. There's no video? OK, then you start. Lady of the Lake. Machli is Lady of the Lake of Ranthambore. And a 
Following my glorious trail, I, my name is Machli. I'm speaking on her behalf. I'm 17 years old, the oldest living tigress in the world. Her home is Ranthambore. I'm a proud mom of nine cubs and recipient of lifetime achievement. A day in my life. Paparazzi never leaves me alone. I'm a little shy, guys. <laughs> Has to be. After all, I'm queen of Ranthambur. See my teeth. Pretty good. I'm a well-maintained 35 years old human being, but I'm 17 in age. Want to have a closer look? Exercise is very important before I begin my day. She's a fit woman after nine, ten cubs. Still. Oh, whose reflection is this? <laughs> it's mine. I better start my beauty regime for the day. Better face my wash, wash my face. See my manicured nails. <laughs> See how stylish she is. Now the day has begun. Let me see my, how my kingdom is. This is exactly one day we spent, and that's how I collected this and made a day. Now, this is restamping the territory. After she saw whatever was around her, You shutterbugs, back again. Catch me if you can. Look at her expression. It's typically the similar one. How are my subjects? Now she's ready for lunch. Oh, yummy stuff. <laughs> she's very, very fond of sambars, you know. Mission accomplished. She did it swiftly, you know. Before we could click. It was over. Have your lunch, don't look at me. <laughs> Is that not the expression? <laughs> well, I'm on diet, had enough. You may have the rest. See her catwalk? Pretty good. Yes, what are you doing, mister, in my territory? There's a tiger she got. You think who's the boss? I'm the queen. I put you down. Winner. Now, time to drink water after the hard day. Come and play with me. She's so happy. She has had a good lunch. Now, time to cool off. She immediately came into water. Oh, that was relaxing. Now, her family. This is, we have been documenting her generation. Meet my family. See, my family, you must see, that's the mother. Mother, this history is from 1990. That her, she gave birth in 2000 to two male cubs. 2001 male and female, 2004 for then three females, then three cubs, three and two and three. So one conserved tigress, one well healthy tigress. You can see how many she has added from her mother's time. Her daughter, T17, three further cubs, continues the family grows. Now, you have to decide, folks. Come and see me before it's too late. Tiger's life is 18 years, she's already 17. So I request you, you come and meet her in Ranthambore. You want to reach out? That's her email address. 
My special thanks I must share with you is Dr. Sandeep Sharma and Mr. Balendu Singh, who have given these pictures to me, who were the photographers. And the text is by two young students, Aditi Priyanka Roda and Aditi Thakur, like you. One is a school student, another is a college student for giving the text. And this is what the Tiger Trust is all about, my address, what have we done. And if you wish to share, first my dona first donation is passion, which you have to give me, the love for the tiger, and of course a commitment, which I'm sure I'm going to carry back home with me, is to join our mission, join our journey, and join me individually with the similar passion and commitment which this majestic animal needs. And with these few words, whatever Whatever feelings I have, I feel so full and I am emotional at the moment because this is a great moment for me in life to come and give the message of my founder, of my friend, and all the friends who I am back home and all my future friends, my future accomplices, and my future generation to join me. Thank you very much. And I'm all here to answer any of your questions. Camera traps are not put in one territory. They are put across as per the data all throughout the area, which is uh, documented. Uh, say, for example, in Ranthambore, the total area is 325 square kilometers. So the camera traps would be led in the area which the, the beat would be informing uh, according to the movements. So if in one territory, there, is not, there would not be one camera, there are more than two to three at a given time. Yes. I noticed you had funding from the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, which part was it the international program? Or, and the question is, how does that look for the next year, for this year and beyond? Do you have any idea of how that might continue or grow or not? Uh, we got this grant for the, for the up to 13. And now we have applied for the Forest Women Guards for training them, because that is one section. And being a woman myself, I feel that is one, one uh, recruitment which they have done in the last one year is still untrained because they can be used very potentially for protecting this. So we have applied, and I, I, I hope we, we should get it. So that is in, in the international division we have. Yes. But you, you want to create uh, women as well. Yes. Right? Now the plan is subject to what is outcome. Otherwise, I'll do it myself. <laughs> there is no problem, because there's no alternative, you see. Unless you make a point in life that you have to achieve this, whether on somebody's funding, otherwise create yourself, or you have people like you. Uh, the plan is that uh, in India, we have recruited the forest women guards first time. 33% was the uh, percentage kept for them. Now, those 33% who have joined in force they are not being given the duties in the park because they are very difficult duties. So we want to bring them at the level of the other guards who have already received the capacity building program and use these guards, these women as to reduce the man-animal uh, conflict because we would be using their skills to interact with the villagers, to interact with the other stakeholders and try to bridge that gap which has widened so much over the years. So it's a very special program with women uh, trainees because the Indian women guards, though they might have been in service, are, are, are quite shy and they do not really, for, you know, they do not really forward coming. So it's going to be all women program for the first six months. It'll be, it's called literate legal, means we are just going to tell them this is an offense and how you need to react at a particular time. And most of the other skills would be for making them come uh, and meet with the other stakeholders and reduce the conflict. So this is a plan for them, subject to its coming. 
if by any chance it doesn't come through the USFWS, there is an alternative plan, and that is that 10 lawyers have already pulled in enough money to generate the funds. So this will happen in 2014. Yes? How much does it cost to train in day one of the one, uh, one, tra one person's training in one year uh, costs us with the, with the lodging, etc. In Indian rupees, I can say, I cannot really know how much to, to say the dollars, but it, it, it takes us about, David, how much should it be? It, it costs about 15,000 bucks per person. So it could be $300. 300 dollars in one year. A year. Oh. One person. Train them because we are giving them training. They are field training. They are they are taken to courts. They are they are transported from one end to the other. Resource material, trainers fee, everything. On and one person, we spend that kind of money. Then how about paying them to do the work for a year? No, otherwise they are employed. They are oh. employed with the government. Oh, they have other jobs. Oh. They are, no, no, they are already fully paid by the government. Okay. It's the money which is spent. Good training. It's a good technical training. It's not that you just tell them and then go away. They really get trained. So for that, that's the kind of cost, which, which is shared normally, by, not totally by the funders, which we share about 40% and 60% comes from the grants. So it's not $300 to be spent by the funder. Most of them, half of it is taken care by trust and the other the part of the forest department. I was trying to think about if the students raised money, um, what would the money be used? Oh, the, the money can be used in many ways. We can give them, we can give certain essential things like the caps or you can say the shoes or you know any other smaller items which they can be put to use. They, they don't have to pick up these tabs at all. Any small amount which we put to use, normally what comes from Tigers for Tigers, we generally use for school awareness. You know, we give it, uh, we use it for the villagers in the sense we have some cultural, we have interactive programs and we use it for the educational programs and sometimes we give them grants in the sense the, the students who do the best we give them kind of scholarship so that money is used because the tiger trust doesn't keep that money is generally put to use with them it depends on the scale so if the scale gets the money is small the, the scale is smaller but at least the continue it continues well, I was thinking if, if every school that had a tiger as a mascot every student in the school gave it one dollar that's good enough. Well, you have a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, invite you to, I'll invite you to share your skills with me out of that. Yeah, that would be good. <laughs> yes? So uh, you discussed the tiger trip that uh, Coach University students take. Like, how would you recommend like, all these other schools, like they want to start something, you know, to get in contact with other parks or yourself, you know, to get a class started to continue like, you know, making this bigger. Because I feel like the trip is huge yet comes to like it brings in some of the students. How would you recommend for them to get that started? Well, it's very easy. If today you feel interested, tomorrow you're going to make a plan. And the third day you will come to consensus that all of you are interested in this. I'm sure being one of the important parts of the Tigers for Tigers being experienced for coming to 10 years, you can join hands. You can have some continuous activity of communication with each other. If Tiger Trust can continue to feed up with information. And then you can plan the time and the month and we can jointly have an activities with the peripheral parks, the, the schools, and the other stakeholders as an interactive sessions with your students and them. And the first thing would be you visit the parks, see the tigers in person, and then you continue to have the first, that is called a very, very small effort. Maybe you could have 10 students, maybe you could have 20 students. Spend four to five days, see the tiger in the wild, and have your first experience have a small commitment. Always have a small, take a baby step. But that baby step should be with full commitment. And then obviously, once you start in one year, then you will grow. And whatever efforts, whatever requirements you have from Tiger Trust shall be given. And for that, you, all you need is to make up your mind. The rest is, we can always fill it. So for that, you need motivational thing. Your, all the schools need to get together, speak to your authorities, tell them we need to save a mascot. And that is the land to go to. All opportunities are there waiting for you. <coughs> yes? Hi, um, yes. Early in your slides, you had tiger estimates, like you 
stress that they're definitely not for sure or anything. But on that slide, it said in 2006, there was an estimated 1,400 tigers. And in 2010, there was an estimated 1,700 tigers. Yes. Was the same method of measuring the tiger population used? Or was one the pug mark or one the camera track? Very good question. Because in 2006, uh, we had part pug marks and part uh, camera method. But it was even in 2006, it was not very sure. But later on, it was completely by the camera method. So that's why the number of 300, it doesn't mean that 300 were not there. See, there are two parts of the tiger survival. One is the territorial. That means the protected habitat where you have, that is a national park. The tigers outside the territory were also counted. So they found, to their dismay or their horror or their surprise, that there were more tigers outside the park than inside. So, because they strayed out. So, keeping those numbers and certain other aspects which they clarified with the technical points, they found that at least 100 or 120 were more. And then in the meantime, the conservation efforts had also improved. And there were so many cubs. You saw just now in Ranthambore. Ranthambore has had more than 14 to 15 cubs in the last one year. So, if the, all the cubs survive, so each, as you have heard in the movie, there, there is basically not 16. 16 is not the correct number. See, the tiger starts giving birth to cubs after every three years. It is not that every year. That's why they say there's a difference between a donkey and a tiger. Donkey gives birth to 10 and tiger gives birth to 2. So that's why they say, oh, the child should be raised like a tiger. Why? With quality, not quantity. Simply, that is why the tiger is always not giving more than 6 to 7 alive, alive cubs because most of them die. Though it is the capability of going up to 16. So if these nine are kept up to their true situation as the efforts are going on, the Ranthambore is already having more population than the territory. So this number is 18 or 1700 which came up was better and uh, you can say uh, accurate uh, methodology which was used. So it brought the number higher. And then of course the poaching is under control. The, the biggest worry right now is rhinos in India. We have lost 45 in the last six months because of the weapons. They have, they come, they come with the XLR, they come with the automatic weapons. In one go, they, 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 I don't know if you know, uh, a rhino is killed with single shot, with 202 bore. It's a very primitive gun. The single shot is right in the, in the forehead and then he's left, bled to die and then the horn is taken away. The value of the horn is in the market more than $3 million because it's being used for the medicine. And unemployment in Assam is so much on the rise that there is so much of money in the park, in the area around that. All the unemployed people are now using this method. So this is another challenge we are going to have. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Anna. You're welcome. Great. Thank you very much.